Aaron, thanks for your, for your time, mate. I think it's going to be extremely interesting to hear about your career, but then also into how that journey has been over the years. Um, so as a starting point, can we just have a quick intro into who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, sure, Carl. I am Darren Hirons. I am an end user um, solution uh, engineer working for VMware. Um, I support all the end user computer products like Horizon and Workspace ONE and specialise in healthcare. Oh, fantastic. And, and how's your... How's your career progressed, right? So obviously you've, you've chopped and changed over the years, but, but what's the kind of trajectory been? Where did you start out and how have you got to, to where you are today? Yeah, my, my, my career in IT started with a discussion at a coffee machine. <laughs> I, I, was, I had no idea what IT was. I worked, I worked for a public sector organisation and I just went to work nine to five and that was, all, that was what I did. I didn't really have a career as what, what I'd call a career as such. I was at a coffee machine one day and somebody who I knew came up to me who worked in IT and said, we've got a job going, do you fancy it? And initially I said, no. And he said, well, you can, you can get paid for working weekends. I was like, well, go on, then I'll have a look at it. <laughs> so that was how I got into IT, really. Just, the, just yeah, my mate just asked me if I fancied a job um, in yeah. his team, so... Yeah, that's that, good. And what was that role initially? Was it a support role? It was a help desk role. So it was like first level support. Um, so that's how I started. And I did that for and I did that for about three years. And then and then I moved into desktop support. So I was doing, you know, I was going around fixing endpoints and doing all kinds of other um, fixes like printers and networking and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of how, how I started off really first few years. But I mean, I'd been working for quite a few years before I got into IT, so it wasn't like I, I started in IT. Yeah, what were we doing before? What was the what was the uh, original role? Oh, well, it was just admin stuff, office stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Data entry, all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, just, just office, just office stuff. Working in public sector. Perfect, and and obviously so you're in the public sector role and things, and then did you transition straight into the vendor space, or or was it? And kind no, of so I, I had a bit. I, been a, moved around a little bit so I, I did that desktop role for a while and then I out of the blue again everything always seems to happen to me out of the blue out of the blue another friend of mine said we've got a contractor role going at a bank do you fancy coming for this so I was like I think I had a I think my daughter my first child was just on the way so it didn't seem like a great time to me to chuck in a permanent job and go contracting but I thought I'll have a look at it, and um, yeah, I, yeah, turned out turned out that I decided to do it, and um, so I left the public sector and went to work for a bank for a couple of years. Um, after that, I went. I actually went back to the public sector for two <laughs> years, and I did that for a couple of years. But I actually got a promotion out of it and went and did. Um, I worked in their server team, so I'd gradually worked my way up a little bit. I guess I guess you'd say. And then from there, I moved to manage an infrastructure team in the NHS. I did that for nine years. And then from there, um, I got my job at VMware. Yeah, and then since I've been focusing on healthcare in, 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 the, in the corporate world instead, um, and, and being at VMware and then going into NHS and, and helping to solve the problems from the experience you gleaned over the years. Yeah, I mean, what's funny is I, say, I said before that um, a lot of my opportunities have come out of blue. Even my VMware opportunity came completely out of blue. I was, you know, I was quite happy working in NHS and I remember I was on the train on the way to work and I was just flicking through LinkedIn like you do on your phone when you're traveling. And I saw on LinkedIn that my VMware SE that I used to correspond with and helped me out at work, um, he'd left. So I just messaged him on LinkedIn while I was on the train and said, you know, why have you left? Seems like an amazing place to work. And he was like, oh. Told me why he'd left and uh and then he said why do you fancy my job and i was like i've never even thought about working for a vendor before <laughs> um so yeah it just it went from there really and like three days later i was offered the job so it went really fast totally out of blue i wasn't even looking and then i was working at vmware three days later what's it been like transitioning into the vendor space uh, i mean i won't lie it was it was tough it was not just transitioning into the vendor space but it was also transitioning into a into an SE role, into a solutions engineer role that I'd never done before as well. So I'd never worked in a role where I was going out, meeting customers, telling them how things worked and mm. helping them solve problems. I'd never done that role before. So I was not only new to 
vendor space, but I was also new to the role completely. The only customers I ever met were customers of IT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not, 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 you know, within NHS or public sector, I'd never gone out and met proper customers before. So yeah, it was a big learning curve, but you know, no regrets having done it. It's been amazing. Yeah, and, and so what does a what does a day in a life look like for yourself now? What, what, what obviously if it wasn't COVID kind of thing, I'm assuming it's lots of customer meetings, a bit of travel. What, what what's the day to day look like? Yeah. God, how I miss travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I mean the good thing, the thing that I've always liked about roles that I've done is I like them to be varied, and I think that yes, an SE role is pretty varied. So yeah, I do go out and meet customers. Um, I do spend some time at home working on labs and learning and doing training. So I get a good mixture of traveling and time at home. Um, I spend most of my time, um, you know, delivering updates to customers about te new technologies, um, advising customers what technologies best fits, fit their problem or their issue that they're having. Um, try, and, try and do that in that kind of architect role. Um, but it's pretty varied. I speak to lots of different people about lots of different problems and propose lots of different solutions, really. So it's just about fitting it all together and proposing the right thing. Yeah, perfect. And mm. what did you what, what did you want to do when when you were little? Right. So when you were finishing school, what did you want to be? <laughs> so when I was at school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and when I actually did my A-levels, um, I still didn't even know what I wanted to do. And I was quite good at science. I was, I'd say science was my strong point. So more out of not knowing what to do than anything else, I kind of stumbled towards some sort of laboratory role, some sort of scientist role. Um, but I, after a few interviews, I found out that I was colorblind and I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, so I had about four or five interviews at different chemical companies, and and uh, and then they said to me, uh, "We've done, we did a test, and they just said, really sorry, you won't get a job in any lab. You're colorblind." <laughs> so, so I went from not knowing what I wanted to do at all to kind of having a vague idea of what I was quite good at, and then being told you can't do that. <laughs> so I, I guess that's why I probably stumbled into public sector and ended up with an office nine to five job to start off with really yeah perfect and so, so obviously we stumbled into the industry um but what would you say the most memorable moment to date has been i mean i've had i've been in it a long time now um there's been lots of memorable moments but i i i think the the, the bad ones stand out the most <laughs> because the bad ones were always a lot you know the, the you tend to worry about things which have gone wrong more than you spend time enjoying the bits that have gone well. Yeah. Um, you know, I, obviously getting a job at VMware is obviously a highlight of my career, but, um, you know, there's been various other highlights along the way, big projects I've worked on, dates and migrations, all sorts of other things. But I, I don't think there's anything really that, you know, that, that especially stands out. I did win, I won an MVP award at VMware this year. That's the first time I've ever won one of those. That was quite good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to get, so it's it's definitely something. No, no. To be yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's up there, definitely. But I don't I don't really spend much time reflecting on it because it's it goes too far back. I can remember at Windows NT. Uh, I can remember Windows three eleven. That's how long I've been in IT. Yeah, yeah. And I've had a few guys where was people talk about the BBC systems and all those kind of things the other week, and it's just like I've had to go on, like Google search and get pictures of these things. So people watching these videos have probably never even heard about half of this stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, trying to set an expectation of what these things are and what they were, and it's nothing like what we've got today. Ultimately, um, picking on the piece around like the, the the things that maybe went wrong. So everything about mistakes that you've made along the way. What was the the biggest mistake and the lesson you learned from it? Oh, I mean, anybody that works in IT that's uh, operate certainly operational IT that said they've never made any mistakes is a liar. Because <laughs> <laughs> the number of times that you know. If you work in operational IT, you reboot the wrong server, you take systems down by mistake. It happens to everybody. And you, you do learn from those things. You learn to, you know, put your own safety checks in and, you know, follow change control better. And, you know, when I started, change control didn't even exist. So, I mean, it's just wild west. Do what you need to do. <laughs> you know, everybody moans about things like change control and ITIL and stuff like that. But they, 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 they serve a purpose, right? They're there to protect you as much as anything else. So... Mm. I mean, yeah, it, it's difficult. I mean, I, I, I've made plenty of mistakes, but I, yeah, I've learned from them all. And I don't think that, 
I don't think that the, uh, any of them were, were career threatening at any point. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I remember um, when I was at Enterprise PLC and I was working working there for many years doing internal IT and I was looking after a, a Citrix farm, ultimately presentation server four. And um, we then did the upgrade and went to um, four, five and five and then six and then I left and went elsewhere. But when we were in version six, um, I was doing, I was using the built-in update features, right, within the CMC. And I was in there and I did everything I thought I'd done right. And I've been doing this for years, right? So like autopilot. But then for some reason, I decided not to remember that 24 hour clock existed. So when I scheduled based on a change request that had been signed off at 9 p.m. at night, and I forgot to put 2100 and I put 0900, when I came in that morning and went and grabbed my breakfast, um, and then all I got was like someone running into the canteen and saying, the Citrix environment, and bear in mind the entire business ran on Citrix, right? So they're like, the, the entire environment's going down. What the hell has gone wrong? And I'm sort of thinking, this isn't good. What the hell's gone on? So the first thing is I sat there thinking that it's something that's obviously broken and it wasn't me. <laughs> and then when I logged in and had a look, I was like, ah, um, that change that was happening later, is happening now. Uh, it'll be <laughs> finished in about an hour. Because <laughs> you couldn't stop it once it started. And yeah, uh, yeah that was a, a memorable moment for me for the basis of the, I, it was a utter mistake, autopilot, done it so many times and complete, just completely forgot to think of 24 hour clock, press go and just forgot about it. Yeah. And again, and to be fair, there was change control in place, but there was no one checking that I'd put 24 hour, 24 hour clock in. Right. <laughs> so yeah. again, it was human error, but that's where most of the challenges come from, I think, in, in IT. Um, so if we think about the, the journey you've had, do you think you've made any sacrifices along the way? Oh, loads. I mean, T time with my family probably most of all um i guess that's what that's what everybody probably says though yeah. i mean anybody that's worked in an operational environment's almost certainly done on call and that's certainly what i ate most of my time over the years uh, i did like years of work. i probably did 15 years easily working on call and i was getting called out regularly as well so um yeah, yeah that, that i mean the main sacrifice i would say is doing that but you know um studying for exams and things like that yeah. as well but yeah yeah it's fairly common right it's like because technology is changing so much you can't you can't fit it into a nine to five and i don't think it's such a job as nine to five anymore yeah. especially in it anyway and um just adding on the educational side of it right with the rate of change that vmware make on their own never mind microsoft and everyone else it's like by the time you start looking into two of these areas or even three you, it's a full-time job in itself um, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't envy you, Cal. You're, you're having to cover all the, all those bases. I mean, it's hard enough just stick, sticking with one vendor. Yeah, I think I'm lucky at the minute. I'm still, I've still got a young mind to a degree, right? And I think it's slowly getting worse, but it's getting harder to retain information, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I think that's where, where people need to, to understand that it, it's not just a, a you thing and it is a wider team thing, right? So, uh, and especially as a, as a, well, my role now is under managing people in pre-sales architecture. But if I think about when I was a consultant, I always had that mindset that I had to be the one that had the answer. I was the one that would go into a, into a, into a customer meeting because they're paying thousand pounds a day for argument's sake for me to be on site to, to do something for them. So they're looking at me as the expert. I must know the answer. But actually, they're, they're probably not expecting me to have all the answers and, and that was the actual case in a lot of circumstances and it, and it was more on the lines of the the pain for your logical thought process and the way you yeah. troubleshoot and the way you can de-risk things and where the experience has been previously everyone's going to fail on emerging technology to a, to an extent um and i think yeah. that's the biggest thing that i was i learned quite early on in consultancy that you, you don't have to be the guy that knows it all mm. and you can rely on other team members you can rely on google and all those kind of things to an extent to help you along that way um, and yeah, especially definitely. in the role that I'm in now in technical pre-sales, right? And the same as yourself, you, it's easy to to miss something because we're, we're kind of at this level of, of thought yeah. process and not into the nitty gritty widget configuration all the time. I think also, I think what makes it more difficult is that the rate of change has increased so much with with, with a lot of services moving to cloud. The, you know, the rate that things change is so much faster than when it used to be perpetual software. Yeah. You've got, you know, weekly, monthly changes now as opposed to once a year when a new version of some software comes it's out. It's this thing that the cart releases, right, for Horizon. 
and things like that. And it's like the, the, the rate of change happening there just on an agent perspective is, is fast enough, never mind anything else in the back end from full feature releases. Um, yeah. And I think if we think if we pick on the cloud-based services, right? If we take like Horizon Cloud Service or we pick on um, the, the, Air, the AirWatch or the Workspace One element of the mobile device management pieces, they're all ultimately as a service offerings for consumers, right? And you'll be putting changes in there left, right and center. It doesn't mean they're going to adopt them but it means yeah, they're there when they need them. And I think that's, again, part of your job, right, is to go out there and make people aware of what they've actually got available to themselves that they may have already procured as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, there's a million and one features in these, these bits of software, but, you know, there's probably only a small proportion of customers that use all the features. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, you know, a part, you know, part of mine and your job is learning the most common features and being proficient in those, I guess. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing I've learned over the last maybe three or four years is more around mapping it back to the what, what is the actual outcome that I'm after. Yeah. Forgetting about the technology to to an extent, right? And thinking, right, well, what is the business value? What is the outcome? What am I trying to make operationally efficient? What is the reason for this change? Rather than we can do some really cool stuff with this, are you interested? Because the answer generally is that's great, but it works. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of resellers and even vendors to an extent now where everyone's transitioning to that business outcome model, right? Everyone's asking the same question. How can I enable you to do more with less? How can I enable you to meet your IT or corporate plan? Those kind of questions. And, and I think that's where that gap between technical people and business commercially aware technical people is slowly becoming a, a bit of a blurred line to an extent where people are now becoming a little bit more um, aware of the impact of technology rather than just being the, the techie in the corner doing the bits that he loves. Yeah, I think you've got to be aware of the business benefits of software and stuff if you're going to be an SA. You can't just know the tech. It doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah. yeah. yeah it doesn't sell itself anymore, unfortunately. Uh, you, can't, <laughs> you can't just sell just on technical, but, you know, the technical elements of it. You have to know, you have, you have to be able to link those back to the business benefits and what the customer is ultimately trying to, so trying to solve and trying to achieve. Yeah, um, that's that's ultimately how you how you can position how can you can position things properly. Yeah, exactly. And I think if you think about um, looking back over time, right, and you're looking at a younger version of yourself um, that had just come into the IT industry, or you're looking at coming into the industry now, right? What what three tips would you give yourself? Oh God! Uh, <clears throat> so don't be afraid of a challenge. I think is you know I I, I made some brave jumps like i've mentioned at the start like where i went you know i had a child on the way and i went contracting and stuff i think don't be afraid don't put too many obstacles in your path i think i, I had a really famous quote once i think it was um, richard branson and he said if you ever get offered the dream job but you don't know how to do it just accept it and worry about it later <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i thought it was a great quote because like you can learn how to do practically anything don't worry if you don't know how to do it i mean i was the same at vmware right i didn't know how to be an se but I just, I was just brave and I took a leap and I've learned how to do it. Right. So yeah. my main bit of advice is don't be afraid of a challenge. And, 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 and if you get an opportunity, just grab it. If it's something that appeals to you, just grab it. Don't worry about whether you can do it or not. You can learn how to do it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things we touched on in a few sessions around recruitment, right. And recruiting teams and people and all those kind of things. And I think pretty much everyone that's a manager has pretty much said that um, they re re recruit based on, personality and attitude more so than technical acumen uh, and the, the the reason for that is anyone can learn the tech right with the right attitude um yeah. you you could be the best technical person since sliced bread but have a really really poor attitude upset customers upset the team ecosystem break the culture that you've built and then that's just not really worth it in comparison to maybe skilling someone up and making a career for someone yeah no totally agree I, I i've managed teams in the past like in the nhs and stuff and you, you don't always go for the person who's the most technical you've got to get a blend of all those different things really yeah yeah, yeah. And, and any more tips for yourself oh um <laughs> i don't I, I think as well as as well as not being afraid of a challenge i i think i, I in my early career i never um I probably didn't have enough confidence in myself, in my own ability. I mean, I, I always thought I was quite good at IT once I got into it, but I probably, you know, like when I, when I said before, I didn't ever think I'd be able to work for a vendor. I didn't ever think expect to work for someone like VMware. 
Mm. I probably should have believed that I could get to that point, even, you know, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I should have had aspirations to, to, to work for a vendor probably, but uh, maybe, maybe just wasn't ready. Yeah. Well, I think everything happens for a reason, right? I'm a true believer of that. And it's right moment, right time. And as you mentioned, right, you've, Fallen yeah. in into some of these roles, you've met people along the way, and they've remembered you and offered you your positions and all that kind of stuff. And I think, I think that's the other thing as well is the industry is that it is very incestuous, right? It's very small. <laughs> yeah. And you'll be working with someone one week, and you won't see them for three years, and then they'll just crop up in the job role right next to you without you even realizing. And I think that's where uh, I, I know there's some individuals in the market where they've they've kind of burnt the bridges a little bit, right? And and that's a very bad thing to do, and especially in the UK and EMEA market space for IT, the skills mm. are so in demand that you're going to come across paths in the future and it's not really worth upsetting someone. Yeah, I think get to know as many people in the industry as you can. I think I think another another thing which I just thought of as well, which I would really go, if I could go back, I would I would definitely recommend to anybody is you know, volunteer for things, get involved in things outside your immediate team. If there's mm. something that's if you want to work in a different team, but you don't really know. At what they do volunteer to go and spend a day with them a month or just ask if you can do it and make it known that you're interested in that and try and learn a bit maybe I, there's been points in my career when i've gone out and done exams for things i don't use in my job but i've done it as a stepping stone to get to some bit somewhere else so yeah yeah you've sometimes got to take some steps yourself no nobody's going to come along and hand stuff to you yeah i know i posted a video um last friday with neil mclaughlin um on his career and his journey and, and I remember on Twitter maybe two years back then right? I remember him posting on there that he wanted to do a uh, at the time an E2EVC session or he wanted to do a um, a Citrix user group thing right and because that's where his background's in his own technology is but he, he didn't have the, necessarily the confidence to do it to a degree and I remember I think anyone looks on Twitter at Neil's past and it was like he asked if there's anyone that he could do it with that's done it before to provide that kind of safety net to get him used to presenting on stage or in front of an audience and that could, it's not something he's had ever had to do before fast forward two years he's now a microsoft mvp mm. right and that's just purely out of his desire to to want to progress and to become a community spokesperson ultimately and engage with people the right way and i think there's one of the one of the tips from from my perspective is just engage with that community get involved don't be afraid to stand up and share your experiences because you might think it's boring and no one's interested, but actually it's a different opinion and viewpoint than that some people may be aware of. And it's worth spending the time to share that information with people. I think there's too often that we look at things as, well, they're a competitor of mine and they're a competitor and I can't talk to that person. And I think at the end of the day, the, the market share is big enough for all of us to have a, a say and an opinion and, and kind of share that knowledge across all of us. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, when we go, when, when when yourself and myself go to conferences and stuff, we mix with other vendors, we chat to people. You know, it's best. You know, the best best approach is to get to know people. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And is, is there been any point in your career where you've been kind of pushed to your limit of thinking, right, I'm quitting, and then you've sat down and shaken off that emotional statement and gone, right, I'm going to overcome it, and you've overcome it. Has that ever happened to you? I think I'm quite a resilient person. I, th I don't recall a point in my career where I've ever thought about chucking it in. I mean, there's been some times in my career where I've maybe done like two weeks in a row of being called out in the middle of night every single night. And, and I've like reached like a point of mental exhaustion. But I don't think, I think I've just wished it was over, but <laughs> never thought about ending it. <laughs> um, um, but no, I don't think I've ever got to that point where I've thought about chucking it in um I've, I've been quite fortunate as well in that i've never really got to a point in a role where i've got to that point either i've always moved before i've got to that point if that makes yeah. sense yeah no definitely yeah. okay so let's move to industry right um so obviously there's a lot changed since um windows 3.11 and nt4 and whatever <laughs> else that you may have worked on in the past but what do you think is the the biggest change that's happened on that journey Oh, uh, I mean, actually, you know what? The thing, if you said to me what one thing or one, one piece of technology has changed IT the most since I started, is VMware, right? The hypervisor. I, I, when I first started managing servers, we had two full server rooms full of server, physical servers. Yeah. When I went back to public sector in 2001, 
I deployed their first ESX cluster. I think it was ESX 2.5, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. um, we basically consolidated two complete server rooms full of racks into two racks. I mean, that's, I, I haven't come across any other technology in my time in IT that's revolutionized IT in that way. And that's, that's not just something which one or two customers did. Everybody in the world does it now. Yeah. So that's, for me, that's the biggest change. And I'm lucky enough to work for that company. So that's, you know. Yeah, it's a good answer. Plug, plug. <laughs> <the ammo. laughs> and um, obviously we're in this current pandemic, right? And there's been positive and negatives to, to this whole situation. Um, let's pick on the positive first. What do you think the most positive thing to come out of the back of this will be? Um, I think it's forced a lot of organisations to realise that people can do their jobs remotely. People don't have to go to an office every day. I think there's a lot of companies who've, who have already adopted that and who already do allow remote working, but there's a lot that have kind of thought being quite old fashioned and made people go to an office nine to five. And I think they've been forced to rethink that and, and, and do remote working. Now, the big question will be how many of those will revert back when it's over and how many will keep doing it? every sort of indication in the press and in the news etc indications are that a lot will keep doing it which i think is going to be quite a big change yeah and i hope that they're doing right i think this there's this, this this thing around choice right and i think it is a choice moving forward for people to want to work from home because it's shown that people can in a lot of cases so they give them the option right that they can work from home they can go to an office so many days a week or whatever it might be and it bridges that work-life balance if there is such a thing and all that kind of stuff but I think if I think about myself personally um I want to go to an office one day a week right at least because the water cooler conversations the social element getting to know your your peers and your your team members and all that kind of stuff is it's a lot easier face-to-face -face than over webcam um but then at the same time I know that people that have to go in Monday night till five like I just mentioned because it's dictated to them via their their organizational culture yeah. Um, and I think that's wrong. I think if people have been able to work for the last eight, nine months in this situation from home and still be productive and meet targets and all that kind of stuff, then there's no real reason to force yeah. them to go back to the office unless they need to for mental health reasons and not having the space at home and all that kind of stuff. I think the, the thing for me, right, when this is all blown over um, in hopefully the not so distant future, um, the I can see there's going to be a massive influx of people that are just going to turn and go, right, I need to go out to an office for a, for a period of time, right? And everyone's just going to, the offices are going to be crowded because everyone's going to be back there because they're going to be able to socialise. Yeah. Um, and then it'll fall back to one day a week, two day a week. But the first few months of offices opening properly again, I can see it being an absolute nightmare. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who are just dying to go back to the office just to speak to somebody different. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the other thing to keep in mind about this as well is that the more that companies allow people to do remote working, the better work-life balance people will have. Because if you think about all the time that it takes your average person every day to travel to and from the office as well, mm. that's time that they, they get to be more productive and work or spend time with their family. So, well, I, I know individuals, right, that before this pandemic did not a single bit of exercise, like none, right? Their exercise was literally maybe walking to... A tube stop getting the tube walking from the tube stop to the office right and that's it never did any exercise whereas now because they're not having to do that hour to two hour travel to the office for whatever reason i know people that are exercising going to the gym cycling whatever for that hour a day because it's they've got the time to do so now and as, as individuals and for health purposes and things that's got to be much more beneficial to the organization than them wasting yeah. it on a train journey yeah, definitely I mean, somebody who's, you know, you know, um, mentally relaxed and mentally less, less stressed on, in, in their day-to-day -day life is bound to perform better, right? So if you have to spend two hours battling through traffic to get to an office every day, you're not going to be at your peak when you... So you're going to turn up pretty angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, the next one's about unsung heroes, right? So my view on this one is things like Microsoft Flow. Right. It's a product that everyone's generally got access to as part of a license, but they never use it to maybe automate their days. Is there any technology you think that are unsung that people should be using that they're not? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, 
I, I mean, I'm pretty boring when it comes to technology that I use. <laughs> we get given Zoom and we get given Teams and Slack and, you know, I just make do with what tools I'm given. I, I can't really think of anything that I use which people probably wouldn't know about. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty run-of-the-mill application user. Fair enough. And do, do you think there's any any areas of technology within our customers that is undervalued and not not invested in? Oh, end user computing, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it depends what sort of customer you're talking about, really. You know, some customers have got more money than others, and some some have got more um, some have got more focus on security than other areas. You know, financial organisations, for example. And, hmm. um, I would say if. Any area is probably underinvested in across the board. It's probably security. Um, I, I think you could probably never spend enough on security because there's so many ransomware attacks. And you mm. know, I think it was only last week Hackney Council got hacked last week with ransomware. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you can't go for more than a week without hearing about somebody getting attacked with something. So I mean, yeah, I would definitely say security is probably the main one. Yeah, and I, I, I concur with that to a degree, right? Because everyone has this concept of secure by design and making everything as, as secure as it can be. But yeah, trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the realistic terms of it is just that when, when budgets come down to it, people just can't afford some of these security technologies. Yeah. That being said, I think there's a lot of things that don't cost a lot of money that people aren't doing as well. Uh, yeah. And, and also the other thing is that historically, lots of people thought of, of security as those perimeter firewalls, and that's not really the most best way to spend your cash now anymore i don't think i mean they're still necessary but there are other ways of of um, of, of adding security well, value without i think the biggest thing is is that i think everyone talks about your biggest threat vector is actually behind those firewalls and in, in, on your internal network it's not on the yeah. external world yes there's threats there but i think the, yeah. the more day-to-day -day mundane things is the phishing attacks that happen right that's then compromised from an internal perspective and angry aggravated employees and all that kind of stuff are probably more of a challenge than than a hacker from another country potentially trying to get access to your systems and services. Yeah, totally agree. Your east-west traffic's as much a risk as your north-south. Yeah, it's definitely um, a big problem for everyone, like, is phishing attacks. Yeah, and they're getting a lot more realistic, that's for sure. I think whoever, whoever, whichever security company comes up with a solution for that, if there is one, they will make a fortune. Yeah. Because I don't think, any, I don't think anyone really... Lots of people, I mean, even VMA, we've got lots of solutions which can kind of help mitigate and stuff. But if anybody could come up with a solution to completely stop that, it would be amazing. Yeah, and then stop it right at the entry point, right? Where yeah. the yeah. spoofing element, if it's got logos for a company that is not the company domain that it's coming from, as an example, and very basic things like that, right? That could be a starting yeah. point. Because a lot of these things are like, um, if we take the ones that consumers get, Right, like the PayPal ones, the Facebook, the LinkedIn's, that kind of thing. And every day. Yeah. And, and if they're not, they're not even from paypal.com or paypal.co.uk, and you think, how does that not get blocked by something? Yeah, because for me, I thought, I'd have thought that any simple security tooling from a, an email security point of view would just say, well, the domain name is X. Yeah. It it's doesn't matter. with the word PayPal, probably isn't PayPal. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I know you can now get, depending on the, the mail clients that you use, it just give you notifications that this might not be from a true source sender, but it means you've got to take an action on it, right? Rather than it being blocked in the first place. Yeah. Um, I think there's still a bit, there's still a market there that, that somebody can, uh, you know, leverage some technology to help with that. Yeah, I might, I might start having a think later, see if we can make it. <laughs> <laughs> if you could solve that problem worldwide, though, you could make a killing. I mean. Yeah, I don't think I'm quite as clever as I'd like for that, I don't think, but I'd, I'd give it a good go, but I'd, I'd ultimately fail. Um, cool, so let's go on to lightning round, right? So um, last technology purchase. Uh, so, I mean, I've got an iPad in the last month. I tell you what, I, I, it's not necessarily a technology purchase, I suppose, but I bought a gadget which allows me to connect my guitar to my MacBook. Oh, nice. Uh, convert the signal to digital, that's quite cool. Yeah, I think I've, I've got, um, I've got an old Marshall amplifier, right? It's about this big and about that that big, and it's it's huge, right? And I wanted it to come in here, but there's actually zero space in this office for it to go because it's too big. Um, but I've also got a really old piece of technology from um, I think the company's Boss, and it's a, it's a small little belt clip 
It's a mm -hmm. mini amplifier with a headphone socket that you can put on yeah. a belt clip and play with the gain and the treble and everything else and basically have a mini amp on your belt yeah. buckle whilst you're playing battery operated and it's brilliant and it is about 20 years old. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like something that I, I, I got, I, I sold on eBay recently, actually. Yeah. Um, a Pandora box that I had, which did the, effectively did the same thing. It had like effects and stuff in it and you just clipped it to your belt. Yeah. This, this one that I bought now is called an iRig and you can connect your guitar directly to your MacBook and you can, you can, you can plug it into GarageBand and you can simulate from like hundreds of amps and hundreds of mm -hmm. effects pedals and it's like, yeah. You know, I think the thing I like most about that, and off topic slightly, right, but it's, I, I, I love playing songs, but I always struggle to get the amplifier settings to meet the settings of the original song, right? <laughs> well, yeah. And you that... can actually download the, um, for GarageBand specifically, the presets for, say, Black Sabbath or right, ACDC yeah. and all those kind of things, right? And it sets the amplifier on GarageBand to be of that setting. So you get the pure sound, which sounds like, the right settings it should be for a live performance of that that music it, it's an amazing piece of you know it's a very underrated piece of technology is garage band i think especially when you think that apple give it away for free <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah it's a great piece of tech i use it quite often i've been it's you know it's definitely piqued my interest back in playing guitar again because I've, I've not played for quite a while but yeah yeah and I, I know that um for a bit of a joke just to fill the time with my son recently we did um with my camera and microphone, right? We walked around and I had him banging on doors and then bang, banging like um, tins together or whatever and recording the sounds and then putting them into GarageBand and making a, a, a music That's uh, piece for himself. But the concept behind it was around making, and it's only four, right? But I wanted to be quite creative. And music for me is a big thing that, that I was brought up with. And I think that I want him to, spend time with those things and realize that music isn't just an instrument it could be any kind of noise it could be any kind of tip tap it could be whatever and you can create a lot from mm -hmm. from that never mind learning a an instrument and don't get me wrong right he's going to learn an instrument that's for sure i'm going to make sure of that but um <laughs> the thing is is that i want him to understand that this, this creativity that can be found anywhere which is quite quite key i think for a four-year-old child to grow up with from my opinion, yeah. I, I, it's one thing that I wish I'd done years before. I, I mean, I started learning, I started playing guitar when I was about 16, but I wish I'd have started years before. I wish I'd have learned some other instruments as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can play, I can play drums a bit and I can play a few other string instruments, but yeah, I really, the one I really wish I'd played is a saxophone. I always wanted to play a saxophone, never got one. Yeah, well, I'm going to do a shameless plug for my brother's band, like a Disney award winning. Um, Three piece with a, a bass, a, a, a saxophone, and a and my brother who sings and sits on the cajon beating the drum ultimately. Um, and they've been on Disney Cruise Liner for the last what three or four years, winning awards on there. And obviously COVID's hit and it's completely decimated their career. Um, yeah. But I'm going to put a shameless plug here for his Spotify uh, playlist and an album and stuff, so might as well. <laughs> and he's my brother at the end of the day. Um, who would you say your biggest inspiration is? I, I couldn't single anybody out. I've had lots of inspirations through my career. I think I think there's lots of people that I've looked up to and lots of people who I've admired. Um, not one particular person stands out, I don't think. I like to take things from different people. Mm -hmm. I, one, one, one thing I always say to people is if you're learning a new job, don't ever learn it from one person. Yeah. Always shadow multiple people because everybody does the same job differently. And if you shadow three different people, you'll find three different things you like and three different things you don't like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that more. <laughs> I've always followed that advice. I've always tried to learn from multiple people because you can take the bits that you really like and the best bits from all of them. And the bits where, you know, person number two cuts a corner and doesn't do something properly, you can forget about that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's good, 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 good advice. That good tip. Um, what does work life balance mean to you? Um, it will being happy, I suppose, be content and yeah getting less stress at home yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. to me as lo to me as long as i'm not getting stressed at home then my work-life balance is okay yeah and i think that's that's key right is making sure that your work isn't impacting your family um emotionally physically whatever it might be yeah and, it, and it's certainly a lot easier nowadays that i don't do on call i did on call for like 20 years or something but yeah, I was speaking to a, to a friend of mine who who, who uh, does a support role and he's been on call for the last week and um, 
I think his wife literally now when he's on call in those evenings, he, she just leaves him to it and disappears because he's, he's probably not the nicest person after having no sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I, you know, I feel for anybody that still does it, but it's, you know, it's a good way to learn and it's a good, good, um, it can be, you know, some of the biggest challenges I probably ever faced were at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> and there's nobody else with me. I've got to fix it on my own. It's, it's a good, it's a pressure cooker situation, but it's a good way to learn. Yeah, I had Jim Well on earlier giving me an, a really worrying statement that when he was in his early days of his career and he was working, doing some some change work in an evening and it had to be done between, I don't know, midnight and 6 a.m., right? So at 4 a.m. he's been fighting about getting this new system online. It's just not happening. So he ran across over cable 90 metres from one data centre room to another in a bank. <laughs> massive problem. But the thing is what it proved is that it was the network that was the problem. Um, yeah. and it, it, he, he basically went home and got into bed and went to sleep and left that 90 meter cable running across the bank floor, which meant they were non-compliant for various things, which is quite an interesting tale, I think. Um, fair enough. And what is the most important thing to you is? Um, I guess being happy, being, being happy in, in what I'm doing and happy with my family and, and knowing I guess that people value my opinion and value what I do at work yeah and if you had any words of wisdom to put in a tweet what would it be <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, is this before the character limit was lifted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, I don't know um, don't be afraid just you know grab a challenge and give it a go yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Exactly. Yeah. Favorite song? Oh, <clears throat> Carl. I, I've been asked this question so many times in my life, being a musician. But th th there's like, I couldn't. I honestly couldn't pick one. There's so many fantastic songs that have ever been written. How could you pick one? Yeah, I think someone was saying the other day. Is each song has a different emotional meaning to people. So picking one means you're picking a certain point in your life that you want to remember more than others. That's a great point. Yeah, a great point. Mm. I, so, yeah, so I couldn't pick one. There's lots of, I could name you lots of great bands, lots of great individual songs, but I couldn't really pick one. Yeah, fair enough. What was the last one on your playlist? Oh, <laughs> you don't, you don't, honestly, you don't remember. <laughs> you know, Barbie Girl or something. <laughs> you must watch TV show. Oh, so, so I really like Taskmasters, just started again. Taskmasters fantastic if you've not seen it. Uh, and last question, favourite junk food? Pizza. Yeah, good answer. I'm looking for a pizza, I think. Yeah, I think on that moment, I mean, I'm starving, so we're going to call this a quits and, uh, and go and grab some food. No <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much for your time. It's been, it's been fantastic. You're welcome.